Our next speaker, the lead designer from Inno Games, is Anwar Delati. Now, Anwar has come to the games industry uh, from the old school pen and paper game design industry. And one interesting fun fact about Anwar is that you won't find him anywhere on LinkedIn, but you will find him on the ElfQuest social network. That's right. I know. I bet you're surprised <laughs> that I know that. Cyberstalker. Anyways. Um, I'm very excited to hear his talk today. It's all about monetization through in-game events, which as some of you might know is uh, something that Japanese companies uh, use to great effect in monetizing their players. Anwar. Yeah. Thank you all for being here. Um, as Scott said, I'm the lead game designer for Forge of Empires, and that's the game I'm going to talk, to talk about uh, today. So first about me, Scott already told you everything you need to know. Check me out on ElfQuest. <laughs> and about uh, the company I work for, it's InnoGames. We have, uh, we're based in Hamburg, and we have four live titles at the moment, Tribal Wars, The West, Grappless, and Forge of Empires. And Forge of Empires is a browser game. We have a mobile app in development right now. We launched in 2012. We have around 50 million registered users, and a team of 38 people are working on the project. Uh, most of them developers, but also a lot of graphic artists and other guys and ladies who help me. So, um, first, when I talk about monetization here, I should put a disclaimer. Uh, because I talk a lot about monetization, but we are a proud free-to-play game. I don't know if you've, uh, some of you have heard Aki's talk earlier today. I also, we also strongly believe that the game should be fun and engaging, and then when you are having fun, you will be glad to pay, hopefully. Um, so although all the next slides will, will, will revolve around monetization, um, this is only what we do to uh, keep the game um, alive and keep uh, money going in to uh, develop the game further, to have even more players come in and uh, that they are going to have more fun and even on a broader game. So in order to under understand some of the next slides, I would first have to tell you something about the game itself. Uh, Forge of Empires is primarily, some would say, a city builder. And we have the typical monetization options for a city builder there. You can expand your city for additional premium. You can build cooler or better buildings. And you can instantly construct them, because constructing building, buildings takes up to a day in our game. So it's a rather slow-paced game. But it's also a history game. And you have to, uh, you might recognize this. It's a pretty standard tech tree. And you go through the tech tree, take the city all the way from the Stone Age right now until the modern era, so 1950s. There you can also pay uh, premium currency for speeding up your research and paying special unlock costs. Again, it's a free game. So that means these special unlock costs can also be acquired in-game through proper planning and acquisition of resources. We also have a huge, huge campaign map that spans three continents right now. And before, you can actually uh, acquire territories there. We call them sectors. Um, you have to scout them. And scouting takes up to two days. So you can, again, speed that up. And you can also acquire sectors without fighting for uh, the same special items that you also need to unlock in the tech tree. So you can also play this game completely without fighting. But you can also play with fighting. And in that case, you can uh, just challenge uh, other players or um, conquer the campaign map, which is a PvE option. There, you can invest some money, some premium, into healing and reviving your units so that you will make better progress. And you can sometimes, especially during events, acquire special units. So why am I, all, why, why am I telling this? Because um, we make a lot of money through our quest system. Um, because this is not a PvP game, it does not have the usual pressure that you have in many, many online games uh, where, oh, I need to be better, right? I need to be better. I need to grow faster because Otherwise, other players will bash me or gobble me up. So we have a huge player base that is not very harshly incentivized to pay. And um, by putting up these uh, quests, 
we actually uh, incentivize them a little bit more. As you can see, the, text, uh, the quests are re real, have real text and story. They're not just generic quests like uh, do a fight or build a building. Uh, they also have texts, and uh, they use as success conditions all the previous stuff that I've just told you about, like, like acquire a sector with or without fighting, it doesn't matter, or scout a sector. And through this, because all of this can be accelerated through premium, we offer additional incentive to um, spend premium there on these core features of the game. Um, we have two types of events that we regularly run. One is the smaller, it's a called, they're called quest events. So it's just a quest line with some additional goodies at the end, unique buildings and that kind of stuff that people usually like to have in a city builder. Um, and then the bigger ones are called feature events. We call them feature events because they actually add for a limited amount of time a new feature to the game, a new type of gameplay feature that they can use. And through using that feature, they can acquire then uh, special goodies. And we usually put in more additional goodies in these events than in the smaller quest events. Uh, yeah, Just by looking at this, you can see that there's a lot more effort involved in the feature events. And I'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. So let's look at the events in 2013. It's actually a misnomer because I start with the Halloween event in 2012. As you remember, 2012 was the year we actually launched the game. So this was our first actual dedicated event. And uh, we, it was a pure quest event, eight quests. You had nine days to solve them. And solve here is the right word because they were actually given as riddles. So it was not clear what you actually had to do. We thought this was a, like, a cool, a fun, thing to do, but also, also had like an unexpectedly high uh, positive uh, side effect that players went to the forums. Like We had a huge influx of players into the forums inquiring, I don't get quest number five. What the hell is this about? I don't really understand it at all. Um, it had no effect on daily, average, uh, daily active users, but that's because we, uh, through our in-game mechanics, already have a very high pressure for a, a player to be daily active. But we gained 17 uh, additional percent in revenue dur during the time daily. So uh, it was a very, very small investment on our part and paid off handily. The next event we ran was the winter event, so just two months later. And uh, this time we added more quests and we put a slight focus on um, running quests that, uh, that you could actually shorten with uh, premium options. Because you had 25 quests in 37 days, this does not sound a lot, but usually, as I said, our game is slow paced, you do a quest a day, then you miss a couple of days, and suddenly at the end of the, of the event time, you're under a bit of time pressure, so you might, you might monetize more. So by, these, by, by having these um, events in the game and that they run for a limited amount of time, we do put this additional time pressure into the monetization that is otherwise more or less missing from our game. Um, it seems we did quite well with this, because this time we had 40% additional revenue. And still, we had a lot of good player feedback. This is because the players felt like, OK, these guys are only asking me to do what I would do anyway. right? They are just putting like an additional incentive at the end and putting some additional time pressure in front of that incentive. So uh, it, w it did not feel like it was a pay to win event. Right? When I ask you to scout a sector, hey, that, that, that's what you'll be doing anyway in a week or maybe in two weeks. I'm just asking you to do it right now. So we ran a few other events, Valentine's event and our first anniversary event. Those were also quest events. And again, no feedback and no uh, effect on daily active users. Um, but always we had a very good uh, feedback on the forums. What we found out is that we trigger the events daily as in, instead of just giving a quest chain that is available from the very start, uh, we were better at increasing our revenue. This is not surprising because some performance players played through the quests that we calculated for, let's say, a week in two days, and they were not under a lot of pressure. Now, if you put the same seven quests um, and they appear only one at a day, that means for the last quest, they only have a day. 
regardless how well they otherwise have performed. Yeah. The Easter event that we ran was our first feature event. We added a, a new social interaction feature where you could hide, um, hide Easter eggs in other player cities, and then the, the players could collect those eggs. Why should you do this? We added quests that actually asked you to hide Easter eggs, and then you would get an additional uh, amount of Easter eggs for yourself. This worked quite well. Um, but as you can see here, uh, we went away from this pattern that we actually used, would use um, our core monetization here. And so the quest did not ask you to do anything that was our core monetization, but uh, only to do some additional stuff. And finally, the X could be traded in, re in for rewards in this uh, reward window. This is our um, daily revenue compared to uh, our previous daily revenue before the event. So 100% is our average daily revenue before the event. As you can see in green, in the dark green here, uh, our revenue went up during the event. Um, but it also dropped off, off after the event. Why? Why did this happen? This is, of course, not very good. We still made, we still made a profit, I can say that much. But, uh, of course, product managers, are any product managers here today? Yeah, a couple of them, they don't like graphics like this, right? Okay, so first of all, we had a low participation rate. That was a very basic mistake that we made. We did not put this up enough. We, di we didn't really advertise for the event other than just having a small additional quest icon. And uh, when you came into the game for the first time during the event, we did not really advertise it. 96% of all, all trade-ins were done with the free eggs that players exchanged among themselves. Um, we still could live with the revenue, so that was not a big problem. And as I, as I said, we believe in free-to-play. But here's the critical thing. It activated only existing payers. So for the, uh, premium, I, for the premium options that we were, gave during the event, uh, we only activated those, those players who were paying anyway. And because they usually have a limited budget, you see that drop off after the event because they say, okay, I've just spent a good amount of money here and I've acquired some cool items that I can use. So I'll just chill now, relax a bit, and not pay so much anymore. That resulted in 20% additional revenue during the event, but a drop off of 10% in the same uh, period after. We took those things that I just talked about, those mistakes we made basically, and tackled a new event, the summer event. It was a Wheel of Fortune type event, and uh, you could again do, again, spins on the wheel by doing quests. This time we re return to our successful pattern of actually uh, making the quest success conditions tied into the core game. There was an additional twist there because the wheel was shared among a whole neighborhood. That's a small collection of players who have roughly the same level as you do. And uh, every item on that wheel was only available four times. When other players kept spinning and won that item that you maybe wanted, you would come there and then see, oh, damn, that, that's too bad because I really wanted that item, but it's gone now from this wheel. So you had the option of spinning again until the whole wheel was uh, completely gone, or you could refresh. What we could see here is it was a very interesting behavior uh, that many of you might know already. You have, we have some high spenders, and what they did was they would go come into the game, they would refresh and refresh and refresh again until on that wheel, we had random prizes on that wheel, the specific item that they wanted to have would show up, and then they would spin and spin and spin until they collected all four instances of that item on that wheel. And guess what they were doing after that? Yes, they would refresh again and again and again. So this, was, this proved to be an excellent option for high spenders. And uh, this resulted in the following numbers. As you can see here, on the left you have the Easter event during the runtime and after. And uh, then you have the summer event during the runtime and after. And I've split up this revenue. Uh, the dark green is our core monetization and the light green is the one that comes solely from uh, event premium options. As you can see, we actually managed to activate a very high amount of core monetization options here. They increased by 44%, um, almost the same level 
as the specific event monetization options. We also improved our participation rate this time to 89% just by um, putting up a special info screen when you, when, you enter the, when you enter the game for the first time during the event, it will say, hey, it's a summary event, try out our cool new stuff. So it's a very, very simple thing and that you, should, that you all should keep in mind. If you do some, something, something special, make sure it is noticed. We improved the payer conversion, this time by 56%. So we had 56% 56 additional, 56 additional payers as compared to the, uh, um, to the time before the event started. And that resulted, oh well, first, 93% of the spins were still made from free tickets. And again, we are proud to, to be free to play. We increased the revenue by 95% in total, and you can see the split there. We also had tried out a premium sale, and that resulted in a huge spike, but also some liability. Luckily, the liability drained off by 75% during the event. But most importantly is this, um, this improved payer conversion. Because we activated so many new payers, our core revenue didn't drop off after the event, but actually, as you can see here, increased by 15% as compared to the, to the time before the event. This is actually the one key learning um, that you should take from this. Uh, if you activate a new, enough new payers, you can still give out lots of good stuff. We were quite worried. Yeah? I, um, my product manager asked me, like, Anwar, can we really do this? Can we give out that, that, that amount of cool stuff you know, for free? And I said, yeah, um, I don't know. Let's try it. <laughs> uh, yeah, But as you can see, it did work. The next one would be the winter event of 2013. Uh, we, had a, we ran a mystery uh, box type event. And we added some gamey elements to the boxes. So you could open up any one of those boxes for uh, 10 winter stars that we had in the game. And again, you could acquire the stars by doing quests with the core monetization. Um, and one of the, one of the items in the, in, the, in the mystery boxes was actually a reshuffle. Uh, so that when you were hunting for a very specific item, you could open up boxes and then either find the item, and that would be great, or you could open up a lot of boxes and then suddenly, suddenly hit a reshuffle. Uh, so that if you are a high, high payer again, you would open up the boxes and then find a reshuffle, then you would open up more boxes and so on. It's quite important that you always give, that you don't have a, have a payment ceiling in your, in, your, uh, uh, in your game or in your events. Because we see a lot of really high payers that, uh, that pay a lot of uh, money in those events. The results, we had a huge payer conversion this time of an additional, almost, almost we doubled our payer conversion, player to payer conversion. And uh, we had an absolutely amazing uh, day when we sold an additional package of event currency with the premium purchase. So when you bought like a premium package of 20 euro, we gave you some additional winter stars on top. And that, that, that was so much more uh, successful uh, and also helped the uh, payer conversion because we made a lot of new payers, especially during that day, uh, that it worked much better than the flat premium bonus that we gave during the summer event. As you can see, the uplift in core monetization was not as great as before in the summer event. I don't know why this happened. Um, but maybe it's just because the, because the event itself was so much more attractive because we have 74% additional revenues from the event options. I mean, player, uh, players generally have only a limited amount of money. If they spend a lot of those on the, on the uh, event options, then they're not going to spend so much more on the uh, core, uh, core options. And we had a high payer option where you could buy yesterday's super special item for a very high amount of uh, premium currency, but that did not prove unsatisfactory. Uh, that proved unsatisfactory. So I don't know why, again, maybe we didn't hit the right price point. Maybe we didn't advertise it well enough. I'm not saying it's not going to work for you. Um, it just didn't work for us this time. 
So looking at the two types of events, remember I said uh, quest events were much easier to do. We gain uh, roughly a, an additional 20% of revenue for a quest event and 75% additional, uh, additional revenue for a feature event. And when you look up uh, how much uh, implementation effort that is, that turns out the quest event is quite, is actually much better than the feature event. But then you might ask, okay, why are these guys doing even the feature event? I mean, look at that, it's quite a large number there. 68 man days of development, right? For, and, then, and then it's not even as successful as the quest event. But I believe that familiarity breeds contempt. So if there was a quest event every month or so, it wouldn't work as well. Some conclusions for you. Three lessons for designing your quest system. Uh, if you're about to do a game and still figuring whether, whether or not you should put a quest system into it or how it should look. Well, first of all, if you're thinking about whether you should put a quest system into your game, I highly recommend it. And if you do, you should mix monetizable and non-monetizable uh, success conditions in the quests. You need this because if you only have monetizable success conditions, the high performers uh, will burn through that event very quickly. And if you have some, at least some non-monetizable options that you, they can't shorten, that they can't get around easily with money, then you keep them in the event longer and you have a higher chance of actually uh, triggering uh, event premium options with them. Utilize daily triggers and buffer quests to stall high performers. So daily quests, I already talked about this, you just trigger one special event quest per day this puts more time pressure on, the, on everyone. And uh, buffer quests are something that we do um, when we have an event, event runtime of 14 days, let's say, and you advance very quickly in the first three days, we trigger an additional quest um, that you cannot shorten with premium use, um, and that will give you an additional event currency. Players will not feel cheated by this. Yeah, I mean, if we just dropped in a bomb there and said, like, okay, you're blocked now, uh, please don't advance anymore, then they would feel cheated because, hey, I just like, made a huge effort to advance very quickly, and now you're blocking me. But because we added this additional incentive of, um, um, of the additional pre um, event currency there, they don't feel cheated. Monetizing indirectly through quest events has a big potential to activate new payers. This only holds true um, if your game is not a PvP game, because otherwise you already have a very high monetization pressure. Okay. Three lessons for designing feature events. Luck-based mechanisms ex work extremely well, but will result in some negative feedback. I think most of you have heard this a couple of times during the last talks that you went to, not necessarily on this convention, but generally. But it's still, it's, it's a truism, and it's actually true. Incentivizing premium sales, for us at least, worked much better than just giving a flat bonus on the premium. Uh, premium sales through event currency works much better. And you should always design events that have no spending ceiling, because regardless of where you actually put that ceiling, you might think, you might, who, who here thinks that 2,000 euro is a high ceiling, like one that's not going to be reached? Okay, 5,000? 10,000? Okay, I can, I can tell you, if, if we had put in a ceiling of 10,000, then we would have lost some money. I'm not going to tell you how much. Okay, three lessons for product management. Oh, okay, I'm just a poor game designer. Why am I giving lessons to product management? But hey, maybe it's worth it. The main learning is convert enough, uh, convert enough new payers and you won't, you won't hurt your, your uh, game monetization in the long run. Present events aggressively because we increase our participation rates from 51% actually to 90%. And events do work as a premium outlet for end of content players. We are a content game. When your player is at the end of your content, he's not going to pay so much. But if you drop in a feature event, then he is going to pay. Yeah. So thank you for listening. I would also like to thank my whole team and the analytics team. And any questions if we have time? I don't know. Um, 
unfortunately, <laughs> we are running short on time, and it was amazing talk. I've written everything down, and we'll just blatantly rip it all off. Thank you so much. And, and if you have any questions here, you can contact me.